Thanks very much, Families for Safe Streets and Transportation Alternatives for inviting me to come to speak to you today. Um, this is a presentation concerning New York crash law. Um, this is a type of law that we practice at my law firm, the Law Office of Bacaro and White. Um, and I, I call it crash law because it actually draws on a bunch of different areas. It's criminal law, it's civil litigation, it's insurance law, it's regulatory uh, matters, and um, as uh, I'll show you as we go through the presentation, uh, the matters that come up when someone in your family has been struck and killed, or you or someone you love has been injured in a motor vehicle crash are very complex. There are a number of different areas of law that come into play. And one of the things that we try very hard to do at my firm um, with my partner, Adam White, is to make sure that people see more than just the opportunity to pursue a civil claim. Because of the way the system is set up, um, families of crash victims and crash victims themselves are channeled into the civil litigation system and, and opportunities for trying to change the, 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 you know, the, the forces that put them in the hospital, that, that potentially even killed them, um, are, are pushed to the side, are not put forward, and so there's really nothing done to prevent the carnage on our streets. Um, and so the goal here is to talk more broadly about what people can do specifically when they or someone they love has been victimized by a motor vehicle crash. So could you just go to the next slide? Okay, so this is an overview. You know, responsibility for driver accountability is spread across three different and independent systems. The criminal justice system, the regulatory system, and the civil justice system. Um, those just sound like words, but over the course of what will be about a half hour presentation, I'm going to try to break those down and explain a little bit more of what they mean. Criminal justice system is what you see in law and order. Criminal law, you have to prove a defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There are criminal charges, but there are also violations. The violations are traffic tickets. Um, they are, but they are actually, they go through the criminal law system in certain ways and it's important to understand the dif difference between a traffic ticket and a criminal charge, but it's also important to understand the way those things are similar, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The regulatory system, for lack of a better word, it's agencies that have an independent authority to regulate motorists. So we know the Department of Motor Vehicle has that authority. For cars for hire in New York City, it's also the TLC. And then there's a civil justice system. And this is further sort of fractured and split. There isn't just a claim that you bring against the driver, but, but some of your claims for compensation, for medical bills, for other things um, are, are stuck into the no-fault system, which is really more a creature of insurance law. And then there's the civil litigation, the lawsuits that people sort of traditionally associate with legal action following a crash. Can you go to the next slide? Thanks. So just talking about the criminal justice system, the police investigate and charge people who are charged with crimes. And crimes are classified. They go all the way from the lowest level of crime, which is an unclassified misdemeanor, up to a class C misdemeanor, class B, class A misdemeanor. And then there's the next higher level or, or category of crime is a class E felony. And then D, C, B, up to an A felony, which would be charge of homicide. Um, the police investigate and charge these crimes, and I say sometimes prosecute them. That's not what people expect, but in New York City we have this tremendously overburdened criminal justice system. Um, why it's overburdened, um, people have a lot of different ideas why, and a lot of people say, and I tend to agree with them, that there's a lot of people getting criminal charges for things that should be decriminalized, like uh, sort of, you know, possession of small amounts of marijuana. These sorts of things can give rise to what are considered criminal charges or violations. So they could be a violation or an unclassified misdemeanor. And the police will prosecute those crimes. The DAs ordinarily don't touch them, even though they're crimes. You go to a place called um, New York City Criminal Court, likely, down on 346 Broadway, and the police officer is the one who is trying to prove the crime against you. The DA never touches it. Some very important types of charges for our community, people who are concerned with motor vehicle crash victims, are handled in this manner with no involvement by DAs. And, and frankly, the way they're handled suffers because of that. Um, 
district attorneys do prosecute the more serious crimes. And what we've seen with Families for Safe Streets and several of the members is by bringing public attention to the, the charges against the driver, even though they're relatively minor charges that traditionally would be heard in New York City Criminal Court and there'd only be a police officer there, the DA will actually take them. We saw uh, Manhattan District Attorney's Office adjudicate violations against the driver who killed poor Cooper Stock um, in New York State Criminal Court. Um, so the DA has the ability to reach out to individual cases um, and to bring them in, in a court where the consequences are more serious, um, the attention paid is more serious. Certainly, I think the drivers take it more seriously when they're in a, a real criminal courthouse as opposed to, frankly, these summons courts, which where the police officers pursue the charges and it feels more like the DMV. Um, that's all for the good. Um, but criminal charges are rare, absent a driver who's done one of these three things. Either they're drunk, um, meeting the legal standard for intoxication, not just a drink or two, as in the case with the driver who killed young Allison Liao, who was at half that level after two glasses of wine, um, but at 0.08% blood alcohol level. If they are unlicensed, will give rise to a criminal charge of aggravated unlicensed operation, and um, if they're hit and run driver, um, it can be a serious charge, particularly in a fatal case, it's a felony. Um, it's a low, lower level felony. But, um, but there's two problems with the criminal justice system, which most of the people here know and understand. Number one, judges will nullify many of the other criminal laws that will apply to drivers. So there are crimes such as reckless endangerment, recklessly putting someone else in danger. Sounds like it matches perfectly with what we see on our streets every day and what has touched, unfortunately, too many of our lives. Uh, but judges don't view it that way. They will not actually apply the law the way it's written. Instead, they look for some level of awareness, some level of guilty mind. And what I, I learned, and most people learned in law school, is that there's this concept of the guilty or evil mind, which is the, the aim of the criminal justice system to punish. And unless you have someone who looked like they wanted to do something that was against the law, then um, typically, the criminal justice system will ignore them, and that's what, what has happened very clearly in the area of motor vehicle crashes and violence. Um, hit and run drivers are rarely charged except in the most serious cases, and I put CIS there. Many of you are familiar with the Collision Investigation Squad. It's a specialized group of NYPD officers that will um, come and investigate fatal and, and increasingly near fatal crashes. Um, the total number of fatal crashes in New York City is, it, it, it fluctuates, but it's around 250 per year. Um, the number of very serious crashes are probably about 4,000 a year. And the Collision Investigation Squad handles maybe 350 or 400 cases a year. So it's kind of 10% or so of the serious cases where the CIS should be investigating and, and arguably by law are required to investigate but, um, but aren't investigated. And if it, unless it's one of those 10% of the most serious cases, I have found time and time again that hit and run drivers are not charged. Um, if it's a precinct officer investigating a hit and run, you may have a witness who took a picture of the license plate. You may have unbelievable evidence. And, and Dulce Canton, who's active with Families for Safe Streets, is just the clearest example um, the, the community in which she was struck uh, immediately jumped into action, gathered together all the evidence of her crash, tying the hit and run driver, two evidence left at the scene, a piece of the car was left at the scene, a videotape showing the crash, and the police just did nothing. Um, they would not investigate the crash, period, because they don't view it as their job. So hit and run in a non-fatal or non-almost fatal case is simply not investigated by the criminal justice system. Um, reckless driving and the right-of-way law are the most common charges that one might expect uh, to be brought against drivers who seriously injure or kill people. Reckless driving is an unclassified misdemeanor, um, but courts have treated it as someone who's acting 
Again, with some knowledge of the risks that they create, you have to prove the guilty mind, prove that they knew they were about to hit someone. Um, a fair number of reckless driving charges are brought. The right of way law, those charges are also brought. That was a new law that was created just effective uh, maybe a year and a month ago. And um, it is a unclassified misdemeanor for a driver who um, injures or kills a cyclist or pedestrian who has the right of way. Um, that law was enacted because people are becoming aware that the criminal justice system is not responding to these crashes in any meaningful way, absent drunkenness, an unlicensed driver, or a hit and run driver. Um, but still we find that only a tiny portion of the cases um, have a charge that's brought under one of these rubrics, reckless driving or the right of way. And when they are brought, low-level criminal charges are often pled down to a violation or simply dismissed because an unclassified misdemeanor is considered by the system such a low level of crime that um, it's very, you know, the system is overburdened and they just say, look, pay $500 and it's like a traffic ticket. Or pay $500 and keep your nose clean and we'll seal it. It's called an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal. Very common resolutions for charges that are proven under the uh, reckless driving statute or the right of way statute. Um, you know, even, even when, you know, the, the case is shown, there aren't really particularly serious consequences, but I don't want to minimize it. It's a huge advance in this area that there are actually potential criminal consequences, which we'll talk about later. Um, there, um, there is a huge backlash among some drivers, including some professional drivers, to try to evade these consequences. Traffic tickets for moving violations are also a part of the criminal justice system. Transportation alternatives worked um, for a long time to get um, teeth added to a section of the vehicle and traffic law called uh, 1146, um, failure to use due care. And so it's a traffic violation, but um, the fine can be up to seven or eight hundred dollars, and you can use your lose your license uh, for a period of time. Um, the amendments were called Diego and Haley's Law after two children who were killed in Chinatown and Ells Law about a poor little girl who was struck by a driver backing up. Um, it's not used. <laughs> it is not used. It's unfortunate. Um, you know, the advocacy community has worked very hard to get new laws on the books, including the right of way law and um, Diego and Haley's and Ells Law. And there is just a tremendous amount of inertia in the criminal justice system against charging drivers and giving them meaningful consequences. Our society just doesn't view dangerous driving as something that should be punished as a crime. And, and, and thank heavens we have Families for Safe Streets and other organizations pulling together to show that there's another way of looking at this. Um, again, the other problems with traffic tickets are um, you know, police will investigate and charge and prosecute in court set up by the DMV. There's no role for the families. This has happened in many cases we've handled. Traffic tickets are issued for failure to use due care, failure to signal, failure to yield um, to the driver, and they're heard in the DMV. The police don't fill out the form right, so the judge doesn't even know it. It's a fatality case, if it is, and then um, the, the case is dismissed because there isn't clear and convincing evidence. There isn't someone who observed the violation, and the police have taken some of these decisions by DMV judges, throwing out failure to use due care um, summonses and, and created what I call an observed violation rule. Police will not issue a traffic ticket. Forget a crime. They won't issue a traffic ticket unless they saw the crash. And that is um, one of the biggest problems that we face is, is that you know most crashes are not observed by a police officer. And so these are the problems with traffic tickets being the source of the accountability for drivers. Could I have the next slide? Um, some ideas for making the criminal justice system more responsive to crash victims. Um, I, I, as I alluded to before, I don't think that new laws are really the answer right now. We have section 1146, which is pretty good, um, which is a traffic violation that can be issued if we can get rid of the observed violation law. And we have the right of way law, which is an unclassified misdemeanor, which, which creates some, some potential criminal liability for a driver who strikes and injures or kills a pedestrian or cyclist with the right of way. Um, but it's under attack. 
um, a, a number of bus drivers and their union um, issued, created a class action suit. They said it was unconstitutional, it was too vague to be able to be enforced. Um, they said that we were criminalizing bus drivers for doing their job. Um, I don't think that you know anyone would disagree that the job of bus driver is driving without killing people. Um, but there's some dispute, I guess, on that point. And so you know there's concern about the scope of cases in which the right of way law will be enforced and, and really the future of the law. And so it's great and important for people to let their legislators know that city council members and the mayor's office, that this is really important. This was uh, a centerpiece of the Vision Zero legislation that was passed uh, with the election of the new administration and a largely new city council. And uh, it's a very important piece of law because I think in terms of changing public attitudes, um, making people take the idea of a traffic violation, putting it into this other category of crime is, is incredibly important. Uh, I really think that that's critical in getting people to take their choices while driving seriously, is that they need to understand that it, it could be a criminal penalty because people treat traffic tickets and a potential criminal charge as being very different, the, uh, the second being much more serious. And the whole point is to get drivers to take this seriously, as well as to give some measure of justice to families who may have lost a, a child or a parent uh, and, and they don't see any consequences at all for the driver. Um, this unclassified misdemeanor, which is a very minimal penalty and usually gets pled down, as I said, to a fine, is, is at, at the very least a starting point for real accountability. Um, influencing DAs and, and judgeship elections, that's critical to reform. These are the real decision makers, and that's an area that, frankly, no one has gotten involved in. And transportation alternatives, um, has uh, surveyed district attorneys to see what they're doing in the vehicular crime area. Um, but the problem is that DA races are not contested. Um, generally speaking, um, you know, DAs just sort of take their position and they hold it for life. And um, they don't really care about these issues, certainly not the way our community cares about these issues so passionately. And, um, but ultimately, through um, transportation alternatives. There's also a political action committee called Streets Pack that works directly in the electoral system. I think that um, advocates for crash victims have to directly get involved on a policy basis or even on an electoral basis to, to get at some of these people who can't understand why um, reckless driving that injures or kills should be treated as serious business. Um, NYPD reform this is just my personal view, but I think it's the hardest thing of all. <laughs> I would sooner try to reform public attitudes in general uh, and even try to start picking DAs and judges to run for election than saying we're going to change the attitudes of the police officers who are actually out there investigating the crashes. Um, TA has plowed a tremendous amount of effort into this area. It's almost like a black hole of effort. We have a real difficult time getting police to take this seriously. And the best way to do it is a multi-pronged approach with meeting with them when we can, working through the mayor's office where they're supposed to be accountable, changing the broader range of public opinions which ultimately influence police opinions, and changing the other parts of the system so that those police officers who take this seriously will have somewhere to go with pursuing charges. Um, we can go to precinct community councils and use social media as a pressure point to get our message out there. The police are now all on Twitter. Um, and you know when they're not investigating hit and run crashes, or when they're not taking crashes in their precinct seriously, um, there are ways to make them pay attention. And, and I think this kind of direct action is something to be considered uh, by Families for Safe Streets and, and all the advocates who are working on these issues. And then what victims and families can do in individual cases you know, has to do with who's investigating them. With, um, with cases that are not being investigated by district attorneys because they're not fatality cases, and generally DAs ignore, fatality, uh, ignore all but the fatality cases, unless there's drunk driving or unlicensed driving or hit and run, um, you know, we, can, we can go to the police who, and talk to them and let them know you're watching. Offer your help and assistance, and call them and find out what's going on. And, and you need to create a record when you're dealing with the police. 
that's in writing. And a lot of times, a lot of times, I, I've had situations where police say, "Look, well, you expect, you think that when you send me a letter to the precinct or you fax a letter to the precinct, it gets to me." So there's some deniability there. Um, you need to be able to try to, to, to show that you actually communicated with the police because this is one of the problems. There's not a lot of transparency or accountability when you're trying to get the detective in a precinct who's investigating the hit and run um, to, you know, to do what they're supposed to do. Um, but working with them, not in a confrontational or hostile way, not telling them their job because that can really get in the way, but letting them know that you're supporting them and you want to know what they're doing and what the next steps are um, is the way to go. And with the district attorneys, you know, it's, it's more or less the same thing. You just want that channel of communication. You should try to get your attorney involved who's representing you in your personal injury case to speak to the police and to the district attorney. So that's another person, it's a professional advocate who understands the system and the constraints that the police and the DAs are working within and, and can help make sure that your case doesn't get overlooked because that's really one of the biggest problems is for people who don't call and remind the police and the DAs that they're there and that they have concerns, you know, it just, it just gets dropped. And the next slide. Um, regulatory system, um, the DMV obviously educates and licenses drivers. Um, they do a very poor job of it in my opinion with respect to our urban uh, street environment. They don't impress upon drivers the importance of um, the other modes of transportation. And so um, that's work, that's a huge vista of opportunity and challenge that lies before us. I don't know where it's headed, but I just like to point it out. Um, DMV does hold safety hearings and fatality cases only. Families for Safe Streets has been meeting with the DMV and has definitely won better outcomes and shortened the delay in these hearings. So if, if a family member was killed in a motor vehicle crash, the DMV will bring that driver in. They're supposed to do it within a year. Um, it, it had slipped to two plus years. It's now getting back towards a year as I understand it. Um, and they'll bring them in and the driver has to explain what happened and it is the DMV administrative law judge who's questioning them. And um, you know, Amy, who's here tonight, really kind of blazed a trail and got a DMV judge holding one of these hearings to let her make a statement on the record. It was the first time I'd ever seen that in, in many of these hearings that I've been to and that my partner has attended. These DMV hearings are meaningful for a few reasons. One is the driver will get consequences if they're found to have you know, been at fault in, in causing the death. They will lose their license for some period of time most likely. And we would push for longer periods of time, but um, you've got to start somewhere. Um, secondly, I think it is a, um, it's a platform for bringing public attention to the fact that there aren't much in the way of consequences for drivers. When people think that there are consequences, they think they're in the criminal law system, but actually the most serious consequences that a driver causing a fatal crash ever faces are going to be at one of these DMV hearings in many cases. So um, making people realize, oh, you get dragged in here, there might be protesters or demonstrators outside the DMV, which Families for Safe Streets has organized on a number of occasions. Um, you know, that makes the driver feel like, well, everyone's looking at me like I did something wrong. Well, yes, there's a reason you did. And, and that's, uh, uh, I think, a very useful kind of platform and forum and event that can be taken advantage of um, to help the public understand that, that there needs to be consequences. Um, the TLC has also, um, you know, that only applies, of course, in, in cases of crashes caused by drivers for hire, but um, the TLC has been responsive, and we have had a number of successes with victims of non-fatal crashes involving taxi cabs or livery cars, where they have charged and convicted the driver of reckless driving. You do not have to be the passenger of the driver in order to, to bring that driver up on charges before the TLC. And um, I have been impressed and, and pleasantly surprised by um, the sort of reception these claims are getting before the administrative uh, law judges who hear these. And in a number of cases, we've had cab drivers convicted of reckless driving. In addition, it, it, it makes them take it more seriously. They have to pay a fine up to between $500 and $1,000. Their license may be in jeopardy or may even be revoked due to the points that they get from the reckless driving charge. 
And on top of everything, the finding of guilt may well be binding in a later civil proceeding um, for civil compensation. So those are things that you can do really in individual cases. Um, you know, with the DMV and the TLC are really just these types of hearings that come up. For the DMV, only in fatality cases, although we'd like to expand that. Um, and for the TLC, um, it's really in any case where a driver for hire is responsible. Can I have the next slide? So in the civil justice system, the goal is compensation and not punishment, except in, a, in the very worst cases where punitive damages might be an issue. Um, and, and when I say very worst, I mean you can be a drunk driver and strike and kill someone and you still wouldn't be subject to punitive damages. So it really doesn't apply in 99.9% .9 of the cases. And what makes people uncomfortable about the civil justice system is, is the focus on the money. It's all about getting money and people say, well, that, I, I want my family member back or I want my, my leg functioning again. It's what am I going to do with this money? And they just don't see the point of pursuing a claim. And that's certainly, you know, they're right, and that's um, an understandable uh, response that some people have to the system. Um, there are some other shortcomings in the system that I'll go through quickly. There are also some advantages, though, and benefits that you can get out of the traditional system depending on how you litigate. So I just want to talk about that a little bit. Um, a lot of the claims that arise from a crash are stuck into the no-fault compensation system, which turns it into a struggle between you and Geico or one of these car insurers. And in the case of a fatality, the only no-fault benefit is a $2,000 death benefit. It is insulting, frankly, and, um, and really outrageous and should be changed. Um, many families find this insulting, this $2,000 payment. Um, but, but that's that system. You also have a personal injury claim. The amount of coverage is really a big part of how much compensation is paid, and $25,000 is the minimum coverage for a personal injury claim in New York State. Again, uh, you know, it, it's almost nothing for someone who's had a very serious life-changing injury. I mean, it, it's, it's almost meaningless. Um, in a wrongful death claim, if you pursue one because your family member was killed, there is something in New York that is um, very different than the law in most other states called the pecuniary loss rule. And I find it so difficult and painful even to explain it to parents who've lost a child or spouses um, who've, who've lost a spouse. Um, the measure of damages for someone who is killed in New York State is the pecuniary or financial loss to the people who are entitled to take from that person's estate. So in the case of a child or even a young adult who is not supporting their own family, they're single, um, they're not supporting their parents, um, what is the value of their life? And it's not the value of that person. <laughs> it's the value of what someday they might theoretically have given back in, when they were older and earning more money and could have supported their own parents. Um, it's a rule from the early 19th century when people used to have kids so they could have farm hands. And if you killed someone's kid, they had one last farm hand so the value of what you pay would be the value of a farmhand. Um, it, it's, a, it's a barbaric system, again, that's very different in other states adjacent to New York. I don't know why we keep it in New York, except that it means that reckless drivers face fewer consequences. Um, so under the pecuniary loss rule, I'll just say one case, we were trying to show the pecuniary loss, and, and a mother who lost her 30-year-old son who had just started as a graduate student teaching at Columbia, um, she wanted to have a picture of her son to show her son to the jury, and the judge said, absolutely not. You can't show a picture of your son. What has that got to do with pecuniary loss? And the jury in that case awarded a very low figure. They were given nothing to go on. What, what was this person? What was lost? So this is some of the shortcomings and really frustrating part of the civil justice system. Um, but some of the things that you can do in a lawsuit is uncover evidence missed by investigators in discovery um, because you, you, you discovery is the process of sharing information and, and if investigators ignored a case you can actually get information through questioning the driver under oath through getting documents getting phone records things of this nature so you can do a bit of investigating of your own in the context of the civil case to find out what happened you have the assistance of your lawyer who's being paid 
primarily to recover civil compensation, but you know, should also be helping with the DMV hearing, the TLC hearing, dealing, you know, meeting with you with the district attorney's office, all of these other things that you can do to try to get some more meaningful measure of justice. Um, you know, you can support systemic reform, obviously, to the extent that you donate the proceeds from a civil claim to one of the organizations that's doing this type of work. Families for Safe Streets, Transportation Alternatives, Streets Pack, there's a bunch of organizations that you could support that are trying to change the system. And so when people say, you know, what do I want with, you know, the money, you can do a lot of things with the money that will, bringing, bringing back the state of affairs before the crash is not one of them, but it's something that you can do. And there is some specific and general deterrence. Specifically, you deter the driver who faces um, this possible liability that may go beyond their insurance and may affect them personally. Um, and, you know, social, in, in society there's an effect. And people read about it in the newspapers. Oh, there, were the, there was this lawsuit and, you know, this driver could be ruined by it. You know, who knows? Maybe they could be. You have to go beyond the insurance amount that's available in order to create that sort of perception. But you can do that with aggressive litigation and creative settlement terms. So can you go to the next slide? Um, so unlike having to work within all of these systems, if you have a civil claim, and it's a strong one, um, you know, you can agree to anything. And you can make the other person agree to anything as a condition of not, you know, not having to go through to trial. So, um, you know, I'm just going to use as an example the settlement that we've reached, um, a tentative settlement that's about to be reduced to writing with the Liao family, who's very active within Families for Safe Streets. But there, I mean, there was a videotape that showed the death of their daughter and the injury to um, the girl's grandmother right there at the scene. And the driver really mishandled things and first denied his liability and tried to put the blame on the victims. And eventually he came to see, as we got closer and closer to trial, that none of this was going to work. He had limited insurance. And what we ended up with a settlement was one that I think was very significant. In addition to the insurance money he has to pay thousand dollars out of his own pocket. He has to agree not to drive for a period of five years, which he's willing to do, and he has to write a letter of apology and responsibility for what he did, explaining it. And it's not going to be um, confidential. It's going to be out there when we consummate the settlement. And people are going to see that this guy, you know, this guy really had to pay a lot of consequences, you know. It, was he ruined? Um, was his own child taken? No, that's not the kind of justice we have in 21st century America, it's not a, an eye for an eye, but it's meaningful consequences so that people will stop and think about their choices. So this guy's going to be paying a significant portion of his income going forward for five years in order to be able to fund this settlement. It's secured by a mortgage, a second mortgage on his home. He has to go out and put out a public apology saying that he regretted ever blaming the victims. And um, these are the things that you can do when you have a strong case. You can't get more money than someone has to pay, but you can get other things. You can get them off the road through a voluntary agreement. Um, and these are the kinds of creative things that you can do in the context of civil litigation that you're never going to get out of the criminal justice system or the regulatory system. And then just in the last page, I just wanted to put up, not for the that, but you know, so people can see this is the first one of these letters of responsibility that we were able to get on behalf of one of our clients. Um, it was a gentleman whose wife was, was killed, was struck right before his eyes. Um, the police did not properly investigate the case. They didn't think she was likely to die, but she died 16 hours after the crash. Um, the evidence of the driver's alcohol use had been lost. Um, and the driver did not get any serious consequences in the criminal justice system. He did have to, you know, we got, you know, his insurance paid, whatever insurance there was. We insisted on there being a personal contribution from the driver because we, we felt he needed to open up his wallet to understand the gravity of this. Um, and um, he had to write this letter, which was provided to the authorities in the UK because the victim in this case was a British subject. And they have a system there that is actually, um, better than ours, I think, where there is an inquest, it's called, where you have to determine the cause of death whenever someone dies. And they will 
do a full-blown investigation, they want to know. And if it was a drunk driving crash, they will treat it as um, a, a criminal act that the person was killed. And so this letter was presented as evidence to the coroner um, in his inquest in the UK. Um, and, and this was very important to the family that they got the driver to basically admit to his alcohol use in this notarized statement. Um, so that's just an example of, um, of how you can go beyond collecting a sum of money, um, which is not insignificant, but it, it's not the whole picture. Um, that's the end of the presentation. You can turn it off. And you know, if folks have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or just talk about it. If folks have ideas about how we can bring consequences to drivers um, more than we already have, I, I really just have a seat so that we can talk around the table. Did the press pick up? Did you do a press release on that statement? And did they pick it up? That, the terms of that statement are confidential. So there's no press associated with that. Um, the Liao statement will be a public one. You mentioned that we need systemic reform. What can we do as an advocacy group? Uh, what is the major thing we can do? Um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities nowadays because um, the concept of Vision Zero is in the public eye in a way it never has been before. And you have a lot of people who are starting to rethink um, their view toward what we call traffic violence. And it's not just cost of life in the big city, it's you know something that is preventable and that we can change. So those opportunities, I mean, there's so many of them. I mean, I think that working with police um, is, is one of the most important uh, because it's one of the hardest. Um, working with district attorneys, uh, working with each point of contact in the system, really. If, if you find yourself a member of FSS, which is the club that no one wants to be a member of, um, what you get with your admission is the opportunity to have a meaningful impact at each step along the way. Uh, when you meet with the district attorney, if you do, um, when there's a safety hearing in the DMV, if there is one, um, when there's a TLC hearing, which you need to initiate yourself um, if you or your loved one is injured by uh, a driver for hire. Um, at each step along the way, you can really affect a lot of people. And again, of course, with the police, either one-on-one -on -one when they're investigating your case, or if, if they won't, if they stop talking to you because you're asking too many questions, you go to the precinct community council meeting once a month, and you can say, hey, I'm just wondering why isn't my case being investigated, and then why aren't my calls being returned? And, you know, someone's going to have to deal with you. <laughs> how, how do you think the, the, the community that cares about this could begin to educate judges? Um, not, you know, outside of the election realm. Is there an opportunity or precedent that you think of in your legal experience where the advocacy community reaches judges and starts to create culture change there? Um, that's a really interesting question, and the, the very easy and conventional answer is to say there's no way. Judges are supposed to be insulated from public pressure. They're just supposed to be dispensing wisdom because they know what's right. Um, but that's, of course, not completely true. Um, they're elected officials. And there are meetings and conferences um, for judges at times to talk about issues of concern and interest to the legal community and even the broader community. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it would be extremely difficult, but worth the effort to try to organize some kind of judicial conference to talk about these issues. Because I think judges, I think everyone who is touched by a crash victim, and, and particularly someone who's lost a family member, um, it, it has an incredible transformative effect sometimes. And judges are in the uh, position to influence the system most, most directly, and they are the most insulated from those people and those concerns. Do you see a pathway whereby the civil the civil system and the activism that your clients have been undergoing in that system can influence the criminal system 
Are there pathways to make connections between some of the progress you've made in the civil system? Um, I think that, um, I mean, again, I think people have different views about where um, the driver accountability effort should be headed. I personally don't um, want to put too much emphasis on criminal consequences because some of the things I alluded to earlier, that there's an overzealous policing, um, there is, um, you know, unequal policing, um, there are all sorts of issues, and, and, and frankly what we want to do is try to prevent traffic violence more than making sure that stern justice is meted out in a criminal justice context. Um, I think if we could just, um, you know, get the right of way law to be enforced in the range of cases that we always wanted it to be, that, that the way it's written it should be enforced in, which is, is clearly hundreds if not thousands of cases in New York City alone, um, that would get the message out that there are potential criminal consequences. And, you know, that, that, that's really the only message we need to get out. I'm almost more interested in using the criminal justice system as an educational tool for the specific people who are charged and for the broader public who hears about it than I am about saying this person needs to get a, have a criminal history, which they almost certainly will not have by virtue of the unclassified misdemeanor in the right of way law because it's such a minor charge and, and always gets pled down. I have a question. Why is it uh, in a car crash between a pedestrian and a car and the driver, shouldn't that driver, every driver be tested for alcohol and why isn't that done? Regardless of whether they look intoxicated or not. Um, there is a constitutional issue that is raised whenever police want to give you a test. It's considered a search under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution and there has to be a standard that's met um, of some kind of a, you know, based on either a field sobriety test or smelling alcohol or some other factors that will justify the invasion of your constitutional right to be free from government testing. And one of the things that, that makes me, and really because it makes my clients so outraged, it makes me outraged, is the fact that in a fatal crash, where the victim had, you know, is, is not there to tell their side of the story, there will almost inevitably be a toxicology test done on the victim because once someone has been killed, they don't have constitutional mm -hmm. rights. And so you can have a situation where a driver wasn't tested for alcohol, or perhaps, as in the case I was talking about before that resulted in that apology letter, um, the test was botched by police at the scene with bad equipment. Um, you know, that driver never ends up really being found to have been used to alcohol, and yet the, you know, the remains of the person they killed are tested. And if that person had a drink or two, well, you know, that, that's an issue that's out there. That's part of the investigative results. Um, so it's, it's a very, you know, but it just shows the, the dual aspect of the, you know, many different areas of law that come in here, even constitutional law, which I didn't mention, but we, you raised with your question. A lot of family members have asked us if, you know, how long after the crash can they try to pursue any of these avenues of justice, civil, regulatory? Um, really, the sooner the better. Um, I find that families, particularly if it's been a fatal crash, are not necessarily in a place emotionally to be able to jump in and start full bore pursuing all of these things. And, um, you know, the problem is that crash evidence is ephemeral. It's fleeting. It disappears within minutes after the crash or hours or days. So videotape gets overwritten within a week often from businesses that may have captured the scene and, and skid marks get washed away or have to be investigated. They can show you how fast the driver was going skid marks, but if they're not captured right then at the scene, then people won't know. There's information encoded on a computer chip in virtually every car out on the street that shows braking events and speed prior to the crash. But when that driver is allowed to drive away from the scene of the crash, that information is overwritten over the next five minutes after they drive away and that evidence is lost. Um, so getting, getting um, moving quickly with your investigation of the crash is really the way to go. And I, I totally understand that families don't want to 
get into it immediately. Um, but you know, we do recommend as lawyers that you know get a lawyer and give that to your lawyer. Let them be the one going out, collecting videotape, talking to the police, trying to make sure that they're paying enough attention to your case, setting up the meeting with the DA, um, whatever it is, um, so that you don't have to deal with that when you are just you know, in shock because you lost someone.